Hi. Um, it's a really great honor to be here and to introduce Peter. Um, he's a man whose life has been dotted with incredible acts of bravery and uh, really bold actions taken to, to fight for a, a better future for all of us um, everywhere. Uh, so it's a really great honor to be here on this stage and get to introduce Peter. Um, I'm also uh, excited to stand here and uh, get the opportunity to talk about a really important upcoming event that we have in this state. Uh, but first of all, I want to talk about why we're having this event in the first place. We're having this event quite simply because our governments have failed us. The climate crisis is so pressing and so severe, um, and it is completely clear now coming out of Paris that our governments have completely and utterly failed to rise to this challenge. Even of every agreement that came out of Paris is met, we're still gonna have 2.7 to 3.5 degrees of warming, which will leave up to 40% of this planet uninhabitable. Um, it is clear that we've run out of time to such an extent that the only hope we have left is for change to be forced by the power of people's movements. In the same way that force was, uh, change was forced by the women's suffrage movement or the civil rights movement or the anti-apartheid movement or the Indian independence movement. Those powerful, robust people's movements forced change at a far greater rate than it ever would have been achieved in any other manner. And that is the only hope we have left to prevent the climate crisis that we are all facing is that we are going to see a similarly powerful people's movement arise all over the globe that is going to force this change at the pace that we need it to happen. That is why we are having this event uh, the weekend after the one coming up, a week today, um, up in Anacortes, break free is a worldwide wave of actions. There are 30 actions, over 30 actions occur, uh, occurring in over a dozen countries around the world that will target some of the world's largest, most dangerous pieces of fossil fuel infrastructure. There are uh, actions occurring in the UK, the US, Brazil, Nigeria, Indonesia, South Africa, Germany, and a whole lot of other countries and other places. One of the largest actions in the United States is occurring two hours north of here in Anacortes, um, where the two largest refineries in Washington state responsible for refining 47% of the petroleum products that are produced in Washington um, are refined and processed. Um, so far we have 2,300 people who have RSVP'd, over 500 of those are willing to risk arrest to stop the flow of oil going into those refineries and coming out of those refineries. Um, this is not something that people have done lightly, this is something people are doing because they feel so threatened by the climate crisis. And I urge you to please add power to this people's movement that is occurring all over the world. Three days ago in Wales, the largest coal mine in the United Kingdom was shut down. It was on the front page of every paper in Wales. This is happening in every country and I honestly believe from the bottom of my heart after seeing years and years and years of failure of governments to address this crisis, this is our only hope, is for people to get involved and to take drastic action and to force the change that we really desperately need to see. Um, so that is breakfreepnw.org. There are lots of ways to get involved, even if you're not prepared to risk arrest, just turning up and showing up makes such a huge difference. Um, so I please urge you to check out breakfreepnw.org. There's a lot of flyers and everything else there. And now uh, I have said that, I'm going to go back to the main billing of tonight, which is the great honour that it is for me to introduce Peter Wilcox to the stage. Uh, Peter has been working with Greenpeace for over 30 years. Um, he has been uh, at the helm of Greenpeace for 30 years, quite literally. He is their most experienced captain. He has sailed all over the world protecting our oceans and protecting our environment. Um, he was a, the captain of the Arctic 30 ship, uh, which he was part of the crew. Him and all of his crew were arrested opposing Arctic drilling in the Russian seas and spent a considerable amount of time in a Russian prison for standing up what we all, for what we all believe in. Um, so it's a really great honour to introduce Peter to the stage and I hope you can put your arms together to give him the hero's welcome he deserves. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alec. That was uh, a nice intro. 
I started working for environmental groups in 1973. Uh, I started sailing a little bit before that. Uh, I come from a politically active family. My mother and grandparents all were before the House on American Activities Committee. Um, this gentleman, Pete Seeger, uh, and my mother toured, well, she was his bookkeeper when he was touring for uh, political action in the 40s and 50s. In 1965, I was 12 years old. My father woke me up and said, we're going to go on a little trip. We went down to Montgomery, Alabama, where we met the last day of the Selma to Montgomery Civil Rights March. And I had the absolute thrill of joining that march as it went into Montgomery the next day. Uh, that was the march that was met with such violence in Selma. And it was a voting rights march. That's what the civil rights movement was about. To help illustrate that, one of the counties that the march went through was Lowndes County. And at the time, 122% of the white population was registered to vote and 0% of the black population was registered to vote. The feeling at the march, I'll never forget, it was optimistic, uh, joyful, just this feeling of we can do this. And I think the civil rights movement, the few marches that I participated in, sold me completely on the necessity for nonviolent direct action. I think when you're seeking to change the minds of people, you don't do it through violence. You may get some success, but when you want to change people's minds, nonviolence works best. Well, that was Pete on board the Clearwater, which is also where I met the slideshower and my wife, Maggie, uh, in the 70s. I was number one at the draft lottery at the time, and uh, thanks to my immediate predecessor as mate on board Clearwater, Clearwater had been ruled uh, federally approved conscientious objector's duty. And so I went through the pre-induction physical and everything, and just before I expected to get called, uh, President Nixon called off the draft. That was in February of 1973. But I went to Clearwater anyway. Um, it was a lovely fit for me. I, I was... I was an active racer. I still like to race. Sailing is just uh, something I love to do. I'm at sea about six months a year, and when I come home, I sail some more. Um, that was the clear water in front of Indian Point. But the com what I was trying to say was the combination of sailing, for a good reason, I found just magnetic. This, is, of course, is the Rainbow Warrior. In 1981, I joined Greenpeace. I had read about Greenpeace through Bob Hunter's book, Warriors of the Rainbow, and was thrilled of the nonviolent direct actions they were taking. They were really doing neat stuff. I mean, I, the idea of driving the inflatable out in front of the harpoon gun, getting in between it and the whale, to me, that's one of the best actions we've ever done. And it says it all. It doesn't need a caption. It explains it immediately. Direct actions have two purposes for us in Greenpeace. One is they make people aware that an issue is going on. It brings an issue into the public discourse. And so much of the time, that's what we're trying to do, make people aware and explain why we feel about something the way we do. But the other uh, important part about direct actions is that it's invigorating for us. It's, it makes us feel better. I think it's so easy in this world today of six billion people, huge corporations, to feel absolutely powerless and hopeless in terms of trying to affect change. Uh, sociologists have shown, there have been many papers written now, of people that get together, even in small groups, to work for something outside their immediate concern. Not making the rent or not getting food on the table, but maybe recycling or anything. There are so many different areas to get involved with, whether it's civil rights or environmental issues or, 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 or. But doing that is better for you. If you want to come on the Rainbow Warrior and see a bunch of really unhappy people, come on board when we've done 25 open days and no actions. It's, it's brutal. Everybody's dragging and no energy and grumbling and... So 
it's got two things going for it. it. Does something good and it makes you feel better about your place in the in the earth. And that's really the main reason I had behind writing the book. It was to try and encourage, inspire people to do stuff like that. In 1985, it was our year of protesting nuclear testing in the Pacific. Right after World War II, the Marshall Islands was given to the United States. I say given. It was given as a trust territory. Now, the trust territory that had been Germany and is Germany today was given to France, UK, Russia, and the United States. And that was a general trust territory. It meant it was overseen by the UN General Assembly. The United States and the Pacific mandated and had done that their trust territories were strategic trusts, which meant they were overseen by the UN Security Council, where the US had veto power. Now, the mandate of the trust was to protect the people, educate them, increase their economy, bring them into the 20th century. In the late 1940s, the US started testing nuclear weapons in, on bikini. For those tests, the people of Rongelap Island were moved off their atoll so that they wouldn't be in the fallout zone. Then in 1955, the US tested what was the largest atmospheric test we ever made. Uh, it was called the Bravo shot, and it was 1,000 times more powerful than the bombs that landed on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was a hydrogen bomb. Uh, of note, you should know that the basic Intercontinental ballistic missile with six to eight warheads has six to eight 20 megaton warheads on board. One, this one megaton, one 20 megaton bomb that they released on Bikini was from about 150 miles away. They could hear the detonation and feel the heat at 10 o'clock in the morning in the tropics coming from the bomb. For that shot, the people of Ronglap were left on their island intentionally by the military to see what would happen from the damages of radioactive fallout. And the paperwork in the last five years has been uncovered. There's a movie about it called Nuclear Savages, a documentary which is having a very hard time getting shown around the country. Uh, but it really details exactly that it was not an accident. So the next day after the bomb went off, fallout had fallen, people had played in it. Uh, uh, they'd been drinking the water from the cisterns the fallout landed in. Everybody on the island was suffering first degree radiation sickness, uh, skin peeling off, hair loss, vomiting, diarrhea. The Navy came, looked at the people and thought, well, we've got to evacuate them right now or they're not gonna live another few days. So they did, they evacuated them the next day took them to a safe distance away to Kwajalein Atoll. There they monitored their health. After three years and watching their background radiation levels go down, they moved them back to Rongelap where they moved back up again. Now the results from this were that everybody on the atoll got thyroid cancer who was there on the atoll when the bombs landed. There were children born deformed with stunted growth, retarded, Adults suffered premature aging. The biggest victims of the radiation were women and reproductive health issues. Women had six, seven, eight miscarriages before they had a, a healthy baby that lived. Women also had jellyfish babies, which are just what they sound like, something that would live for a couple hours and then die. After a generation of this, in 1980, the people of Rongelap asked the Marshall's government to please move them off their atoll to a different one because they were scared of the future of their kids. Because the U.S. had just spent $100 million in an absolutely futile and wasted effort trying to clean up Bikini, the U.S. didn't want to do that again to Rongelap, and they said no. Five years later, when Greenpeace brought a boat, the Rainbow Warrior, to the Marshall Islands, they asked us, and we did move them. We moved them about 150 miles to the south, which was mostly out of the, the fallout range. And we moved a village of 350 people, all their belongings, uh, except for their livestock, uh, two by fours, plywood, corrugated metal sheathing, and as I said, 350 people on, on the Rainbow Warrior, which was those days about half the size of the current Rainbow Warrior. She was just over 150 feet. So of all the campaigns I've been in with Greenpeace, 
that was the one that left the, the biggest impression on me. To be an American and, and seen what my country did was devastating, amazing. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. Um, we went from there down to Auckland, New Zealand, because we were going to prepare the boat to go out to French Polynesia, who were also doing atmospheric and underground testing at Mururoa. Uh, we got to Auckland, and three days later, the boat was bombed. Our photographer in that picture, Fernando Pereira, was killed. The first bomb went off, um, and blew that hole in the side of the hull. It gave him just enough time to get to his cabin, and the second bomb went off, trapped him in his cabin, and he was drowned. We had about a, a minute and a half to get off the boat onto the dock. Fortunately, we were tied to the dock. Um, the two agents who were in charge of the operation were caught at the airport a day and a half later. Uh, they were questioned by the police all day. They were a Swiss couple, and they needed to fly home a day sooner uh, because her uncle was sick. And the police said they smelled a rat, but they couldn't, nothing, nothing dramatic happened. So they put them in a hotel room that night and said, look, we're sorry, we're taking you to the airport in the morning. Please order room service, use the telephones, do anything you want, don't leave the hotel, and we'll take you to the airport in the morning. And the two agents walked right into the hotel room and got on the phone to DSEG headquarters in Paris and said, well, by the way, we got detained, but we'll be home tomorrow. And that was the end of the story. It turned out later, 20 years later, that the bombing had been authorized by President Mitterrand. It came right from the top. They didn't want a large Greenpeace boat in Polynesia. The French used upwards of 20 agents in New Zealand. Uh, the people that sailed the explosives in in a sailboat sailed out the day before it happened and were detained in Australia, but the cops didn't hold them for the New Zealanders. They then went out, scuttled the 45-foot sailboat, and were taken back to Tahiti on a nuclear submarine. So it was a big operation. For us on the boat, uh, losing Fernando was, was devastating. But there was something else going on. We had thought that if we had scared the superpower, first world superpower of France so badly that they would be quite happy to kill us, to stop us from carrying out our mission, then we must be doing something right. And really for none of us uh, did that mark the end of our environmental careers. Uh, myself and somebody else from the crew sailed out to Mururo a, a month and a half later, were arrested and deported and I'm now banned from life from French Polynesia, but that's all right. Uh, that was 1985, our year of testing, protesting, nuclear testing in the Pacific. This picture is from 2000. Now, if it sounds, if it's starting to sound like I'm un-American, I apologize. Absolutely not my intention. We go after the polluter. We go after the party doing the whatever it is. Uh, two months ago, I was in Japan protesting their nuclear policies. Before that, we were on the high seas protesting mostly Japanese fishing, uh, Taiwanese, not Japanese, excuse me, Taiwanese fishing boats. Uh, so I'm not anti-American. In this particular case, the U.S. had two bases in the Philippines. In about the late 80s, they were closed. Uh, the U.S. had been, and then in a huge amount, buried very poisonous, toxic waste a couple feet, six feet under the soil in 55-gallon drums. In 1991, Mount, Mount Pinatobo, I can never say the word right, uh, erupted. And a couple villages were wiped out at the base. The people moved from there onto Clark Air Force Base. And they began to get sick and sicker and sicker. Krizel, who's in this picture, was born... Uh, well, she was six years old, so she was born in 1994. And when we met her in 2000, she was suffering from leukemia. She and a bunch of other the sick kids from the base came to the Rainbow Warrior. We gave them a bit of a party. We took them for a boat ride. She came back with, with the others, went to the nurse's cabin, and died because it was her time. Uh, it was very tough for us to see on the boat and to know that it was completely preventable. The Environmental Protection Agency had done a review, they had surveyed the site, they wrote a report, said what was necessary to clean them up, and it never happened. So we, and what we had been planning to do all along, 
was we went out to the base and found a huge, uh, not huge, but a large transformer filled with PCBs that was stamped on it, property of the US government. And there was a number saying the Environmental Protection Agency wants you to call this 800 number if you have any concerns. And of course, it was turned off. But the transformer was leaking PCB-filled oil into the, into the soil. So we wrapped up the transformer, shoveled up the soil, and uh, that's the operation there. I'm, I'm driving the forklift. And we put it in that small blue container. The next day, two days later, we took the container to downtown Manila and uh, shoved it up against the gates of the U.S. Embassy. And I didn't notice this till the other day, but one of my favorite parts of this picture is the Filipino security guard on the right side of the container pushing back against the forklift. That's this, he, he's, he, he was either Superman or, or, or something. But we, uh, we put the container up against the gates of the embassy and demanded that they take it back. Since I see a, a number of similar veterans my age in the audience, uh, I bet a, a number of you will remember a name, uh, the name of a guy named Jack Weinberg, who was in the Berkeley Free Speech Movement, who was the man who was quoted as saying, never trust anyone over 30. And he is a, still today a dedicated toxics campaigner, a great guy. And he negotiated with the U.S. Embassy staff through the gate trying to get them to accept the waste, which they didn't do. We all got arrested, of course, but the result of the action was for the first time the Philippine Senate requested that the U.S. government clean up the bases. It still hasn't happened. But in memory of Krizel, who's known all over the Philippines as one of the victims of the base, we, it seemed like the logical thing to do. While we were being interrogated, the policeman finally looked at me and said, we should be thanking you, not arresting you. And I said, right, right. And I got up and everybody laughed. And, I had to sit back down, but 15 minutes later, we were, we were out on the street. Um, and that action felt great to us, as I'm sure it would to anybody, because we were doing something. This is a picture of the Rainbow Warrior going up the Amazon. We've had an office in Man Manaus, which is 1,000 miles up the Amazon, I guess for 20 years. I, I, I'm sorry, I get a little confused at this point. But um, the whole policy the first thing you have to remember is that in a tropical rainforest, the nutrients of the soil are not held in the soil. They're held in the roots of the trees. You cut the trees down, the nutrients get washed away. They can't be held in the soil. So after a year, you have to start adding pesticides, fertilizers, all kinds of toxins to the soil. Those get washed down on the people living downstream that get sick from them, and you've made a perfect chain for just decimating the planet instantly, all for growing a few more hamburgers for McDonald's and Cargill. Yeah, I've been up the Amazon twice now. I'll just slow down just for a second to say that my last trip, we stopped at a couple different villages where uh, people went back into the Amazon to make villages, get out of towns. In the old days, even 15 years ago, if a young couple wanted their children educated, they had to go to the big cities where they couldn't get good jobs. They'd live in slums, but they'd do it so they'd get their kids in school. And now we went to a couple, bunch of different towns where people built their own schools, live sustainably off the land, and live much, much better lifestyle than living in the towns and participating in the, in the industries. That was a really wonderful thing to see. 2011, we went to Greenland. Most of what we do these days is climate change work. Um, as Alex said so well a few minutes ago, climate change is the big monster in the room. If we don't get that, if we don't get a handle on that, really nothing else we do is going to amount to much. Um, uh, I remember being in Australia three years ago talking to scientists on the Great Barrier Reef, the coral scientists, and of course the scientists from Townsville, Australia, are some of the best coral scientists in the world because they have the biggest coral reef in the world to study it on. They were quite concerned, nervous. They figured within 15 to 20 years, the oceans would become a combination of too warm and too acidic to support the corals, and they would begin dying. Well, guess what? Today, 50% of the Great Barrier Reef is gone because the waters in not 15 or 20 years, in two and a half years, went 
They become too warm and too acidic and the corals are bleaching out. This is the one constant with climate change that we've seen over and over again. Make a prediction, two years later cut it in half and start over again. Um, this was in Greenland, 2011 I think. We took the Arctic sunrise up and we did a combination of uh, glaciology and oceanography. We take scientists from, on that trip we had scientists from Woods Hole, University of Maine, Ohio State, Cambridge, St. Andrews, and maybe one or two more. Scientists actually like coming out with us because we don't charge them. And we also don't put any restrictions on what they can publish. We just ask that they share it with us. Now, uh, BP spent hundreds of millions doing research in the Gulf of Mexico after the oil spill, but they owned all the research that the scientists did. So if a scientist made some research that they didn't like, it got thrown in a drawer, locked up, and never heard from again. We put no such constraints on scientists, and that's why they like coming out with us. Uh, the, the, the glaciology is really pretty simple. You take a big stake, you drill it into the glacier, put a GPS on top of it, and measure how much it's moving. When um, our scientist from the University of Maine was coming back to the ship in, I think, 2004, he had been to the same glacier two years before and measured the, its rate of movement. Then he came back in 2004, measured it again, and it had increased by 10 times, 10 times the movement in two years. And I hear now that the glaciers are moving in even faster in Greenland. Uh, the, yeah, you've heard of the endangered polar bears. The picture on the left is Peterman Glacier. It's a 60-mile floating glacier, the biggest in the world. The ice you see in that picture is thousands of years old. It lost a size of it the size of Manhattan about two years ago that drifted down towards Newfoundland. I saw it from a plane one day and I knew immediately what it was. The little black dust in the pools there we called cryocrud. And I don't know what the percentages are, the scientists never told us, but it's a percentage of cosmic dust and pollution, man-made pollution from the earth. It lands in the pools of water, sinks down to a deep part, and then the sun heats it up and it melts down in perfectly round holes until it's out of the sun. Now this is at 82 degrees north. We were, we were there for seven weeks, seven weeks of constant sunshine. I don't mean it was sunny every day. 24 hours a day it was sunny. The only day it wasn't sunny was 4th of July. We had a snowstorm. It's an absolutely amazing place and it was just an uh, eye-opening trip. The kayaks here in the picture, this is again Peterman Glacier from the other direction. Um, they're pulling a couple cables in between them, a transmitting cable and a receiving cable, and we were measuring the thickness of the ice of Peterman Glacier, which is, I guess it starts off probably being seven or 800 meters thick and tapering to 50 or 60 meters thick at the, at the front. But that had never been done before. And that's a, a, melt, a melt river in the ice, and it's, uh, uh, it's an amazing place. Here you can see the the shrinking ice cap of the Arctic, how fast it's going. And it's caused by fossil fuels, just as easy as that. The more fossil fuels we burn, the more CO2 we put into the atmosphere, the more CO2 we put into the atmosphere, the more the oceans become acidic. And we have to stop, easy. So in 2013, yeah, 2013, um, we went to protest a rig in uh, the international waters off the coast of Arctic Russia to the north there. You can see the red dot on the chart uh, where the rig was. The, Russia's, a major, major part of their economy is petroleum exports. The oil fields in Siberia are drying up. Uh, they want to move out into the Arctic Sea to drill more and more and more and more. And we feel that that's crazy. Uh, we, had, we went there in 2012, and the crew put a banner up on the side of the rig. That's not it there, but it was much lower than that, and we're not a threat to the rig at all. Uh, when we went back to do that in 2013, immediately they started shooting at us, and we could see machine gun traces in the water. That's one of the climbers going up the side, 
and the, the Coast Guard crews in the inflatables started swinging them out on their lines and smashing them back in against the steel platform. The Coast Guard crews started slashing our boats with knives, and it was a m level of aggression we were completely unprepared for. I did my first action in Russia in 1983. I did another in 1995. And we'd had a number of campaigners that had more experience with Russia than I did on board. And we thought we knew what to expect. This was right off the chart. Uh, they arrested our two climbers. That was on a morning. Things slowly calmed down. The, they wanted to board us. We didn't let them. We don't have to on the high seas. It's, uh, it's our option. Uh, the next evening, while we were having dinner, uh, men repelled out of a helicopter hovering over the deck, took over the boat. Uh, they pushed all the crew into a couple cabins, stole everybody's liquor and drank it all that night, which I, I actually loved. I think that's a, there's a real tradition of that in, in, in sailors. Uh, <laughs> And at, up to this point, it all felt like, well, business as usual. It's another day with Greenpeace. We've been taken over. We're going to be towed ashore. And this is what always happens in Russia. We get towed to Murmansk. And then you spend two or three days filling out paperwork. They yell, yell at you, and you leave. This time, we, towed, we got towed four days back to Murmansk. They, the first people that met us there were our counselor officials, which I thought was very weird. That's a, a strange thing to happen in that situation or any other one. And my counselor official came on board and he said, boy, I think you're in trouble. I said, nah, don't worry about it. They'll let us go. And he said, I hope you're right. So they took us into the prosecutor's office that night. They said, come in. You know, we're just going to keep you a couple, two or three hours. Then we'll bring you back. You don't have to bring my, yeah, bring a toothbrush, whatever. We got into the prosecutor's office that night or the investigator's office. And they said, right. You're all being done for piracy. 10 to 15 years in jail. You're detained tonight. Goodbye. And we're all thrown in jail. Uh, the way the, the justice system works in Russia is that 99.99% .99 of the people who are put in detention are found guilty at trial. Trial is sort of a show rubber stamp thing. I'm not saying it's completely unfair. And I also want to remind all of us that in Russia, they incarcerate half the per capita rate of people than we do in the United States. And they also don't have prisons for profit. The conditions were not great. We were not cold. The food was left a little bit to be desired. But pretty quickly, Greenpeace started sending us food into the jail so we could augment our diet. Uh, for me, I met the ship's lawyer, but I really had no idea what was going on with my case for the first month that I was in jail. I didn't, wasn't able to talk to Maggie for a month just because we kept missing each other mostly. Um, but there was really no news. And we were separated from each other. So the few times we'd see each other, the rumors would just go out of control and fly around. Uh, after five and a half weeks or so, we were moved down to St. Petersburg, which I initially wasn't very happy about because I was doing all right in Murmansk. Uh, Myself and about half the guys were put in Europe's oldest jail, uh, the Kresge. That's the pictures you see here. Built in 1860. Built to hold a couple thousand prisoners. In the mid-90s, it held 12,000. And you'd have a little jail cell uh, like the ones uh, that that's was in. This one's actually in Murmansk, but like that. And you'd have 10 people sitting on the floor and taking numbers and turns for the beds. Now, we never saw anything like that. I was in a cell like that with one other person. Uh, the hard part was just having all these people telling you, you're going to be here for 10 to 15 years. Here's a dictionary. Start learning Russian. Um, but not really believing it. I mean, I knew Greenpeace was working as hard as it could. And in fact, Greenpeace did a brilliant job of rallying for our cause. By the end of our, our stay, that's Jude Law, by the way, in the upper right-hand side there in the middle. Uh, by the end of our stay, the vice president of Iraq, 12 Nobel officials, uh, Paul McCartney, Madonna, all were urging Pete Seeger, all were urging President Putin to let us go. You're trying to tell me something. I can't hear it. All right. <laughs> um, the Pope? Thank you.
<laughs> she has heard this once or twice before. Um, Greenpeace just did a great job. The whole organization came together. And I think the people that ordered our detention, the person, whatever, don't really know, had in mind all along to let us go after two or three months. We were held in jail for two months. We were given bail, which is very unusual in Russia. And then we were held under city arrest where we could move around the city of St. Petersburg for another month before we were given amnesty by the Duma in the same, the same amnesty that got Pussy Riot thrown out of jail. And I say thrown out of jail because those ladies, they didn't, they didn't want to leave jail. They'd been in for 20 months, and they only had two more months to go. They said, we're not accepting your amnesty, and they threw them out anyway. <laughs> that's, that's tough, um, which we can't get. So, um, you know, somebody asked me at the start of that trip, uh, you know, would you mind going to jail? Well, that's part of the job, although that's the longest time I had spent in jail. Would you mind going to jail for 10 to 15 years? No, no way. I, I, not, I would mind it, yes, very much. <laughs> not happening. Two months was nothing. And two months that really focused a lot of world attention on the dangers of offshore oil drilling in the Arctic. Every year, the Russian oil industry, as a routine of doing business, spills five times what British Petroleum spilled in the Gulf of Mexico. Every year. And I don't think there's any question in our minds that they don't have the technology. We know they don't have the technology for cleaning up a spill in the Arctic. Plus, because of climate change and global warming, the biggest thing we can do to giving a safe future for our children is leave the stuff in the ground. So that's why we were, we were against uh, the drilling there. And I, I think the campaign went fairly well. Uh, two months later, I was back on the Rainbow Warrior, where we met the first load of oil coming out of the Arctic with a group of 250 activists from Greenpeace. We held the boat off the dock for about uh, half an hour, <laughs> uh, but it was a great, great picture. And we actually got the Dutch parliament to debate whether they would allow oil from the Arctic to go through the Netherlands. In the end, they decided they were going to. I'm much to our disappointment, but we got it debated at all was a good thing. So that's been it. I'm, you know, as I said when I started, uh, I guess the biggest reason why I wrote the book is because I think leading an activist lifestyle makes you a more involved, makes you a happier person. Uh, and that's why I advocate it for everybody. And I know that there's going to be an, well, uh, Alec just told us about an activity that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. I hope everybody goes down. I was just speaking in our Washington, D.C. office. I said, look, you guys, you you got to do an action where you all get arrested. That's, that's when you're going to start enjoying working for Greenpeace. And they said, uh, we just did two weeks ago. The whole office had gotten arrested in Washington, D.C. over one of these issues. Uh, and I thought, great, that's great. I mean, you don't have to get arrested, but doing something is the key, and it's fun. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Hello, um, my name is Luke, and um, I completely agree with almost everything you're saying. Um, I really admire what you do, and I just want to thank you. Um, However, at the same time, I'm right now at, at my high school, I'm taking the automotive program, and I'm also very aware of the uh, problems the oil, the oil industry has caused. At the same time, though, I agree that it needs to be brought down a lot. How do you, what is your opinion on how it's going to be brought down in terms of the economy? Because it causes, it's, there's a lot of jobs in it. How do you, how do you propose, sorry, let me restart. How do you think it's? I, I think I understand your question, Luke, and I think it's a good one. I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to give you an answer right here, right now. I think that we have to make the decision that we have to stop using fossil fuels as fast as possible. Okay. Now we're gonna have people out of work, but we can also retrain people. We can do amazing things when we put our minds to it. We, we put a man on the moon. You know, I think we can do a lot, but when half the political system doesn't even agree with the concept of global warming, 
I agree with Alec completely that first we have to get the ball rolling. I mean, Maggie and I were really excited to see the number of windmills in the Midwest when we were driving across the country the last few days. But we have to do so much more because what we do now, every little bit we do now is going to be a whole lot less we need to do in five years. Waiting is suicidal. There are already islands in the Pacific that are going underwater. Already, India has built a massive two-layer, 15-foot high barbed wire fence along the entire border between it and Bangladesh. Because when the next huge hurricane comes and hits Bangladesh, all the coastal flooding will happen and the people need to escape somewhere. And India wanted to make sure they couldn't get into India. So what's going to happen? That's, that's one of the worst case scenarios. I mean, we've already experienced things like New Orleans, super hurricanes, droughts in California for four years. Those are all a direct of global warming. So we've got to do something now. I think your question's a good one. I'm not enough of an expert to give you an answer. Well, I appreciate your honest answer. Thank you. Thank you. What are the upcoming endeavors, the next adventures, activities? For me, well, uh, actually Maggie and I are leaving for the Mediterranean in August. In general now, unlike the old days with the first Rainbow Warrior where I worked four straight years and had the time of my life, now we do three months on, three months off. The next gig for us is Lebanon and Turkey, uh, probably doing anti-coal work. We were in Turkey three years ago uh, where a coal company started bulldozing the olive groves of a small village so they could put in a coal plant, another coal plant. And we were, it's, that's illegal, but who cares? But we were able to focus enough attention on the small village to get the coal company to stop it and save the olive groves of the village, which was their whole, their whole economy, uh, and make it an issue. So I don't know what the exact plans are for Turkey and Lebanon. I imagine we'll be doing anti-coal work. How, do, how can we address the plastic issue? I think there's five to seven gyres. They're also an issue. Yep. I don't know how to deal with it. Yep. I saw a neat little machine in um, Palau that was built in Japan. It's a home plastic cooker. And for every kilo of plastic you put in, you get out a liter of diesel fuel or gasoline, depending on how you have it set. Now, it's been pointed out to me that that's actually not the best thing to do with plastic. But I was impressed by it nonetheless. <laughs> um, yeah, we've turned the oceans into a huge mess. And I don't know what percent, I mean, for the last 35 years, I haven't eaten meat. But I have eaten fish. And today, I really question whether that's sensible because today, farmed fish is mostly high in steroids and antibiotics. Ocean fish is high in plastics. So I don't know what to do. I honestly don't. I still eat some fish every now and then, but not very much. How are we going to get the plastic out of the water? We're talking about microbeads. And nobody's come up with a solution. Uh, there's one young Dutch kid that has a plan with big nets in the water, but I, I don't see that working. And I don't know. I, Do but I've seen it. I've seen plastic in the water. Do you know uh, Captain Charles Moore and his book, The Plastic Ocean? I haven't read the book. He I've heard his... He spoke here at the same stage. He what? He was here speaking uh -huh, at the uh -huh. same stage uh, several years ago now. But maybe you guys can get together. Actually, I think I'm going in San Francisco. I'm going to speak at the Commonwealth Club with some members of the story of stuff who are also doing something about plastic in the ocean, and I'll learn more then. One of the part, things I love about my job is that I learn a lot. Um, I'm really not a campaigner. Campaigners know the issues in incredible detail, but I just get to learn about them, and then I, I sometimes write about them. And uh, yeah, sure, I mean, yeah, plastic's a problem. Can you? Can you describe to us some of the types of people that serve with you on the ship? Uh, for instance, are, are some of them professional, like engineers? Yep. Mostly certifiably nuts. Okay. And, and, <laughs> and a couple of times you mentioned that Greenpeace 
you know, made phone calls or did this or Greenpeace did that, but it isn't clear to me who you mean. You know, like, where, where are those people? I'm not quite sure what I get by your second question. As for the first one, go ahead. Well, like when you were in jail, you yeah. said, oh, Greenpeace did a great job. Yes. Who was Greenpeace? Yeah. Well, when I started off in Greenpeace in 1981, there was 200 people, and you pretty much felt like you knew who was doing everything. Now there's a woman I met here from Seattle tonight, and like most of modern Greenpeacers, I can't even figure out her job title. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't, and I, I, I don't know what they do. Um, <laughs> who works on the boats? It's a real range of people. It's, at the moment, not enough women. Um, I can think of people like Wendy from Minnesota, who's uh, a paramedic, a carpenter, a metal worker, and an activist. And she teaches blockading at the Greenpeace camps, and she's been doing this for 10 years. There's people like, um, oh, I'll do a, a plant over her name, but a, a woman from New Zealand who's a nurse. She just turned 70 on the trip last fall, and she's been with us for 10, 15 years. People tend to stay with Greenpeace for a long time because there's really nothing else like it. I mean, Sea Shepherd's very similar, but they don't get paid. And I got two kids in college. I got to get paid. Sorry. Uh, it's not a lot. It's about a third of what I would make in the commercial industry, but it's enough to go broke. <laughs> um, who else works? Uh, I saw a Indian friend who'd been working on the boat for seven or eight years. I saw him in uh, Philadelphia last week, and he's a computer specialist. And he, the Rainbow Warrior came into India one day, and he came down, and he looked at all the people, and he said, yeah, can I do something? And he stayed on board, became a crew member. Everybody has to get certified pretty quickly, at least as a basic seaman and have papers. Um, but as I said, many of us have been there. I've been there for 35 years. Many have been 10, 15 years in the fleet. Um, and we really love our work. And really, I think the reason I keep going back year after year is because I like the people I sail with. They're a great bunch of people. Yeah. Um, outside of direct action activism, what do you think is the best way or the most promising way to address global warming? You know, I just heard a great answer on this the other night when we were in Minneapolis. Um, if you write an elected official and he gets more than 12 letters, he know he's got to respond, because to, to him, he gets so few letters, 12 letters on the same subject, and it opens his eyes. That's one thing you can do. That's pretty easy. Um, there's so many groups that are addressing the issue, more than just Greenpeace. Uh, I mean, you can give groups money, you can give time, you can give effort. I think giving time and effort is, feels a whole lot better than just giving money. Um, it's an unlimited number of possibilities. But I like the answer somebody in Minneapolis said the other day. It was just get out the piece of paper, write, explain. Learn about the issue, go on the internet, read about it for a couple days, get familiar with it, and then write a letter. That's a start. Uh, you, you've talked about the Rainbow Warrior, the, the ship. How many, um, how big is your fleet? How many, at one point in time, how many different ships are out ar around the world? Are you just the only one? No, Greenpeace has three ships. The Esperanza, the Arctic Sunrise, which is our uh, full-class icebreaker. Esperanza's ice class, that both do ice work. And the Rainbow Warrior, which is our sailing boat. Uh, back in the mid-90s, we had five ships. Now, we don't have the money for that anymore. Um, but, and they're mostly underway just about all the time. Uh, let's see now. The Arctic Sunrise just came back from the Arctic. She's in Netherlands right now. The Esperance is doing a fisheries campaign uh, in the Indian Ocean between Madagascar and South Africa. Um, and the Rainbow Warrior's en route. I just got off her in Korea. She's en route to the Mediterranean where we'll join her in a couple months.
Jill Stein, give it a bit, give it a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you to all who are here. Thank you especially to the Suwamish Nation for welcoming us to your beautiful land, for us to come with you, to stand in solidarity with you, to fight with you for the world that we deserve, for the clean water and the healthy food and the clean air and the humanity that you have shown so much a beautiful example of. We thank you for that. We thank all of the indigenous nations of the Salish Seas. And I think we thank indigenous people everywhere for inspiring and leading the climate movement with your vision and your value and your spirit that you have done so much to teach us of the sense of Mother Earth and how we are all one together as one people. And as Paul was saying, we must also be with the people inside of the refinery. I have had the pleasure, the honor, of standing in the picket lines with the workers on strike in the refineries in Houston, Texas, where they knew they knew what it meant to walk inside that refinery because the minute they go inside, they take their life in their hands. Their risk of dying inside the factory, inside the refinery, goes up sevenfold, 700%, the risk of dying just for walking into a fossil fuel job. And when they heard that we are calling in the Green Party and in my campaign, we are calling for the right to a job for everyone, the right to a healthy job, and a living wage job, and a full-time job, so that as we move forward on an emergency basis to 100% clean renewable energy, we guarantee the fossil fuel workers that they will be covered, their income will be, will be covered, and their benefits will be covered. And it's not only the workers in the fossil fuel industry, it's all of us yeah. that deserve a living wage Woo. and the right to a job and to health care benefits and retirement. Woo. And it's also the right of our young people to have an education all the way through and including college that should be provided for free. Yeah. And that means canceling the debt like we did for Wall Street. Yeah. It's time to bail out the students who are the victims of Wall Street. I'm all for Bernie, I support Bernie. But Bernie has a party that doesn't support him, I'm sorry to say. So for many people, we are plan B when the Democratic Party does its thing, as it has done over and over. So not to get political here, because we are for a vision and a world and an America that works for all of us. And I want to make the point, right now, we are spending more than half of our budget in the United States on these wars for oil that are blowing back at us with a vengeance. We can take those dollars which are destroying hospitals and schools and homes and put them into building hospitals, schools and homes all over the world actually for the cost of our military. But we can also use that money that will fund the emergency program that we need right now, which we are calling for. A Green New Deal, like the New Deal that got us out of the Great Depression. We need that New Deal right now in a green form to take care of two emergencies. We have an economic emergency and we have a climate emergency. We call for 20 million jobs right now to transition on an emergency basis 
to a green economy, 100%, clean renewable energy by 2030. That's an emergency that we must meet. We can put everyone to work creating that new green economy, clean energy, a healthy, sustainable, local organic food system, and public transportation, and restoring our ecosystems yeah. so we can reclaim our fisheries yeah. and our Woo. clamming industry and our oyster industry, which is being destroyed by pollution, which is being destroyed by climate change, which is acidifying our waters. So we can fix this. We can revive the economy. We can turn the, cli the tide on climate change. And we can make the friggin' wars for oil obsolete. And I want to just finally echo our Lumi brother who spoke Lummi. earlier about Lumi, excuse me, the Lumi brother who spoke earlier so beautifully about rejecting fear and rejecting silence and not buying into any lesser evil. We have to fight for the greater good. It's the greater good, not the lesser evil, because our lives depend on it. And they do. All of our lives, our future, our climate, our nature, Mother Earth, we are all in this canoe together. Together we have the power. Remember this, 43 million people who are locked in student debt. There's only one campaign that will cancel that debt. You are looking at it right now. <laughs> 43 million people is enough to win a presidential race. It is a winning yeah. plurality in a three-way race. Get the word out. We have the power. We can create an America and a world that works for all of us. Thank you to the indigenous nations for leading the way. Thank you for all of your courage.